everyone. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for joining us for our second panel. Um, I am Josie Duffy Rice. Uh, I am a writer and um, a formerly president of The Appeal, and I'm really excited to be here um, moderating this panel full of so many people that I um, really admire. Uh, so I want to make sure we have enough time. So I'm going to get started um, and introduce our our panelists um, and give a little background on what we're going to be talking about today. And then um, we can get started with some questions. So uh, as you all know, the movement against mass criminalization has always been kind of an uphill battle, right? I mean, historically, both the media and the politically powerful have harmed and not helped the movement to decarcerate. But currently, we're in a particularly strange moment, I think. On one hand, there's been drastically increased momentum around criminal justice reform uh, for the public, from the public, I'm sorry. And on the other hand, the fear mongering that we've seen recently about rising crime um, poses a major obstacle, I think, for people interested in decarceration. Um, so I have just such a great panel here to talk about these things. Um, and I'm going to introduce them now as soon as my page works. Okay, now it's working. Um, we have uh, Emily Bazelon. She is a lecturer in law, senior research scholar in law, and Truman Capote fellow at Yale Law School. She is also a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine. And uh, two years ago, wrote a book I love called Charged, the Movement to Transform American Prosecution and in Mass Incarceration that I highly recommend picking up if, um, if you don't already own it. We have Jess Brand. I, is Jess, do, can you guys see Jess? Jess, if you're on, turn your video. There we go. Oh, there you go. Hi. Um, sorry. So we have Jessica Brand. She's the founder of the Wren Collective, which is a strategic advising firm of lawyers and policy experts who provide communication, policy, legislative, and campaign support to leaders in the criminal justice space. Previously, she served as the legal director at the Justice Collaborative, and she is also a former public defender. We have Steve Descano, uh, who was sworn in as the Commonwealth's attorney for Fairfax County and the city of Fairfax in January of last year, in January of 2020, um, and previously served in the Obama administration's Justice Department for six years, where he specialized in the prosecution of complex financial crimes. And we also have Sam Lewis, the executive director of the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Uh, before becoming executive director, Sam, who is himself formerly incarcerated, created the Home and Redemption Team, a group of nine former California life prisoners who go back into California state prisons to provide hope and connection. So thank you all so much for being here. Someone has to say something so I know that the volume is working. Thank, thank, thank you. For, okay, for, for, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Sorry, I, I didn't, not to put you guys on the spot, but I didn't <laughs> want to keep talking and be talking to nobody. Um, so uh, we're talking sort of about the obstacles and the opportunities in a moment like this, especially in the progressive prosecution movement and space. Um, you know, I think we're what five years out from Kim Fox's victory where, you know, this kind of shift has been happening for half a decade to a decade at this point. And we are, um, I think, seeing kind of a new era uh, move in of what progressive prosecution can look like and and what obstacles progressive prosecutors face. So um, I'm going to ask a quick question to all of you uh, about an opportunity and an obstacle that you see in this moment. Um, and uh, that's a that's a tough question, but I'm going to ask you for one each. Um, what you would like to see uh, in the near future in this movement and one obstacle that you think is really um, uh, presenting some problems when you think about the future of, of decarceration. So uh, I am going to, and then we're, we're going to go to individual questions, um, but I hope that we can have a conversation and everybody can jump in when they want to talk. Um, but for this first question, I am going to start with you, Steve. Okay, great. Thanks, Josie. Um, an opportunity and an obstacle. I think in this uh, moment, a real opportunity really uh, exists in more suburban jurisdictions. Um, to spread the movement. I think, um, you know, a lot of the movement has spread or started um, coming out of cities uh, where 
um, where we're just starting now to get into more suburban jurisdictions. I, I know myself, I, my jurisdiction is 1.2 million people. We're a suburban jurisdiction. And before the, the um, you know, the, the movement of, of the last year, the protests of last year, a lot of people in, in the suburbs really never gave a lot of thought to uh, disparities in their criminal justice system. So I think the opportunity exists now that people are cognizant of, that, of it to really dig in and we can educate those individuals. Uh, the, the obstacle is just the flip side of that, um, is that there in those jurisdictions, there may not be that depth of um, groundswell of support yet. And people are still very, um, they can still be very influenced by, by people who will kind of spin the, the Willie Horton top on crime. You should be scared, scared, scared. So I think that, that those two things are the, are the flip side of the same coin. But I think that opportunity really does um, exist to expand the movement into uh, more suburban jurisdictions. Thank you, Steve. Jess, what, what you, why don't you follow up on that? Um, good, I'm glad to go second because if I went last, I would have nothing left to say. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I think the Sorry, opportunity, no, last, so. <laughs> I think the opportunity is, um, is that we can really look at long sentences and how unnecessary they are. When the progressive prosecutor movement started, it was like really low hanging fruit, right? Like misdemeanor bail reform or like ending the prosecution of marijuana possession offenses. And we're beyond that at this point. I mean, I live, um, I'm from Steve Descano's jurisdiction. I grew up in Fairfax County. Now I live in Texas, which is not a liberal hotbed. And we're like even beyond, you know, the marijuana stuff here in this crazy state. So what we can really look at is, okay, but people are in prison for 20, 30, 40, 50 years life. And we know, in fact, that people aren't dangerous for that long and that people can come home and be a productive part of their communities. And we're starting to see people really address sentences like that. California is really a leader, but Illinois just passed a bill like this. There's bills that are dropping in Florida, um, in Pennsylvania, all over the country to really think about long sentences and how we think about harm. And I think that's really exciting, especially if you're going to think about how to roll back mass incarceration. You can't just go with these low hanging fruit um, sort of short jail sentences. Um, but then what's the, you know, what's the big problem? Um, I would say fear um, and fear that is stoked by some combination of police union, sheriff union and, and media which is that when there is a crime that happens, people think it's happening in their backyard. People think that it's coming for them no matter where you live, no matter how highly unlikely and just tragic the event is. And, and we've seen that kind of fear lead to mass incarceration in the future. And I think you know, we are at a tipping point where people are trying to push the same playbook today. Thank you, Jess. Sam? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would say the opportunity we have right now is to amplify and elevate the voices of people that have actually been inside the system. Uh, I often say when I speak to, to uh, crowds of a hundred or a thousand that I'm not unique, I'm not a unicorn. There are thousands of people just like me that just need an opportunity and resources to be able to be successful. And given those opportunities and resources, like, there's no doubt about what people can do. Uh, and being able to amplify that means we need to have this on media and the news. Uh, we need to have it on sitcom or, or uh, 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 talk shows. We need to have it front page newspaper. We need to have it consistently. Uh, the barrier is that the media doesn't cover it. The sen they, they sensationalize uh, crimes, but what happens to the person who was abused as a kid uh, went through hell from age seven to 14 and then was locked up and then turns his or her life around and comes home and becomes a positive uh, contributor to our community, uh, is a leader, is a mentor, is, is, is an example for others to follow. We never see those things. And so the opportunity is to amplify that in the media uh, and the barrier is the lack of that amplification. It's just the flip side of it. You don't see it. Uh, around me, it's almost like I work in a, a silo because I see thousands of people that are doing incredible work uh, that were locked up in our carceral system sometimes for decades, but have come home and, and give back from the heart every single day that they're here. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam. And Emily, I'm going to let you finish us off. Sorry. But I mean, I, I think I'm going to 
pick up on what Sam is saying to just add that there are more and more people positioned to lead organizations, to be spokespeople, and they're starting to be germ on the other side too. So, you know, one example of this, um, someone I'm very fond of and respect a great deal is Carrie Blankinger, who went from being just a kick-ass reporter on these issues in Texas to being at the Marshall Project. And I hope we're going to see more and more of that because then the kinds of resistance I think that um, sometimes, Sam, you're, you're encountering to telling those stories, and I hope you talk more about that, the people who you're trying to appeal to on the media side may get it faster. Um, so that's at least a hope that I have. On the, um, on the side of obstacles, I mean, one thing I really see is that it was one thing for the rest of the criminal justice system, the cops, the judges, the mayors, the probation and parole departments to give a lot of power to prosecutors when prosecutors were using that power to lock people up for as long as possible. I think now that prosecutors, some folks are trying to do things differently, we're seeing second thoughts about um, just letting prosecutors use their discretion as they choose. And so the pushback I see in some places is not really from the voters. It's not the community. It's the rest of the entrenched system just refusing to change the status quo. And that's because change is scary, not like necessarily for the people in the community who, you know, based on the reelections we've seen of people like Larry Krasner, the district attorney in Philadelphia, like they seem like they're on board. But I mean, I spoke to all of the elected judges in Philadelphia after my book came out, and I have never have not encountered such a resistant group to change. I mean, it was really pretty breathtaking, and it just made me aware of those sorts of systemic challenges. And they're kind of hard to cover. They're like boring and structural a lot of the time. So I think that's a, a um, obstacle or at least a challenge for us in the media. Thank you all so much. So I'm going to um, start with you, Steve. Uh, I started with you last time. I didn't mean to start with you again, but here we are. Uh, because I, I, will, I, really I won't take it personally. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to ask um, about how this past year has been for you. You know, this panel is sort of talking about this inflection point where we are trying to see, where, where we're still kind of figuring out um, what happens in this moment for certain prosecutors when they choose to um, implement more progressive policies or more decarceral policies, and also trying to predict where this is going in the future. So on one hand, um, you know, oh, sorry, uh, I want to know sort of about your both sides, the fight for more law enforcement accountability that we've seen kind of nationwide, as well as the more recent fear mongering and how that has affected your job and your role um, as a local D, uh, prosecutor, Commonwealth attorney, DA in other, in other states. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's a great question. And, you know, the, the first piece of it, the law enforcement accountability part, um, you know, that's something that myself and my office, we really pride ourselves on because um, it's really something that I, that I ran on. If you think about, I, I think about um, every day what I promised people when I ran for this position and, and I promised them that I was going to um, build a justice system that they can be proud of, one that that actually, uh, you know, is on the right side of history, um, that does the things that, that should be done. And that includes holding all individuals, including law enforcement, accountable. Um, and in a lot of ways, that was a really, really, in my view, kind of a sacred promise, and people bought into that. And you know, coming in the office and recognizing that just because the actual election season is over, that the campaign to um, the campaign never really stops. Um, so to that end, we've really focused on fulfilling that duty, and, and we we've done that. You know, unfortunately, we've been in situations where we have had to um, indict officers. Um, indict members of, of, of sheriffs uh, and put in policies where we have individuals watching body cams, not just for body cam footage, not just for um, uh, use in their case, but also as a check on the officers to see if they did anything that was criminal or to see if there was anything that violated their general orders and we would need to start either a criminal or internal affairs investigation. Um, so we've done all of those things because it's what the community demanded of us. 
Um, and I don't think it's, uh, you can't shy away from that, even with all the fear mongering. I think you have to lean into what you promise to people and what the, the values of the community really are. Now, that being said, there has been a bunch of, a bunch of fear mongering around some of the things that, that we've been doing. And to Emily's point, a lot of that fear mongering really has come from individuals inside the criminal justice system. Um, that pushback that, that she might have gotten from some judges, I can uh, uh, guarantee you that that is not uh, a one-off thing. Um, and I can guarantee you that while we have made inroads to build good relationships with large swaths of our, our police department, there are some individuals in the department who um, took real offense at the fact that we hold people accountable um, and had maybe have, have even gone out of their way to 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 try to communicate their their displeasure both in the media and, and personally. Um, but what I really come to find, it really is what, what Emily said, that fear mongering that doesn't has not really landed with the voters of the community. The voters of the community really have bought into the idea that safety and justice are they're related. They, they flow off one one another and the old ways quite frankly, a tough on crime way, who are on drugs, have not worked and have not kept our community safe. But it's some individual actors in the system that can be the loudest voices. And one thing that I just have to remind our prosecutors and remind myself every single day is um, the actors in the system, they're not the ones that we're here working for. They work with us, but we're out there serving the community. We always have to remind ourselves um, that what the community wants us to do is hold law enforcement as well as everyone else uh, accountable when need be. Thank you. Uh, Sam, you spoke recently about something I think is really, really important, this disconnect between, especially in California, where, where you are, the general California public perception of risk and fear um, and crime, and then what the numbers actually say, especially about people returning from being incarcerated. And this is particularly true of the lifer population. So could you talk a little bit about what the numbers do say and how ARC in particular is combating these misperceptions? Absolutely. So, so when we speak about lifers, pretty much every life sentence is, is a violent crime. And often the narrative that we hear, if you're going to give a person a second chance, it should be a person that, that uh, was convicted of uh, or, or a non-violent non offender is the term that, that's used. Uh, a person commits a crime that doesn't necessarily make that person violent forever. And, and, and I was one of those people. And specifically the numbers in California in the past 10 years, uh, over 10,000 lifers have been released. Uh, within that population, the recidivism rate is less than 1% in the first year and less than 3% in the third year. Match that up against any population in the world, including Norway. You can't beat it. And part of that is because of the rehabilitative programming that people go through while inside and 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 i have though we're not where we want to be at in california in terms of rehabilitative programming we're getting there and that's part of the key when you review a person file like a, 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 a we have a, a penal code for sentence recall called 1170d here in california that's used by uh, uh both the the secretary of corrections and uh, uh prosecutors where you can recall a sentence if a person has demonstrated they that they've changed uh you don't have a lot of prosecutors in the state that are using it. Even though if you say a person has been sentenced to 400 years to life, which is like a ridiculous sentence, what do you die four times and come back? Uh, and this person is, let's say, saved a life, created programs, completely turned their life around. And the secretary of corrections said, this is a person that you, you should consider recalling their sentence on. And you have a prosecutor that says, no, mm -hmm. that's not smart. It's not smart for public safety because when you send a person that demonstrates that they can follow the rules and do everything that's necessary to get back to the person to write their moral compass while incarcerated, to bring them home is enhancing public safety. I came home, I've been home almost 10 years now. And initially I was told that I was a threat to public safety and then a three judge panel overruled that decision. And since I've been home, what have I done? I've enhanced public safety every single day. And I'm not, again, I'm not unique. And what we do here at ARC to combat that narrative that people that have been convicted of violent crime shouldn't have second chances, if we, we highlight and live the life of a person that's redeemed. Like literally, the, if you think about it, 
we have close to 2,000 members now, many of them that have been convicted of violent crimes. Uh, and on our social media and as much as possible when the media allows, we make sure that we highlight this to combat the, the misconceptions by being the living embodiment of what redemption is, by being the living embodiment of what it looks like to have a formerly incarcerated person enhance public safety by being an asset to our communities. Thank you, thank you so much. I am one of ARC's biggest fans. Um, so uh, I really love the work that you all are doing and, um, and really appreciate that. Um, Emily, so you've been covering um, mass incarceration, you've been covering criminal justice versus supposed to crime uh, for a long time. And you were, I think, one of the first people really to draw a lot of attention to this idea of progressive prosecutors to really talking about not only the prosecu prosecutorial power in the media, but also um, what, prose what progressive prosecutors are facing and the kind of the backlash they're getting, et cetera. So, um, and you're still covering that, even though the field obviously has changed a lot now and it's getting more attention. And um, I think the way that we think about criminal justice journalism in the past few years has, has changed. Uh, so what, what, what's gotten easier um, since you started kind of doing this work uh, and what, struggles are you still encountering um, as a journalist covering this field uh, for the public? So I often think that I really cover criminal injustice rather than criminal justice, um, which may be familiar to other people in this group. Um, I decided to write a book about prosecutors because of all the research showing that they increasingly make the key decisions in the criminal justice uh, system and are really elevated in terms of power above judges. And, you know, I think that in itself is surprising to a lot of people. We think of the system as like a triangle where the defense and the prosecution are supposed to be on an even playing field and the judge is supposed to be up here. But for a lot of reasons, especially mandatory minimum sentences and the stacking of charges that expanded criminal codes have allowed, prosecutors really have replaced judges because it's charging and plea bargaining that really determines the outcome um, for most cases and effectively bakes in the punishment that people receive. And then I got lucky, which is that um, after I started working on my book, the, this movement to elect people making progressive promises as district attorneys really got going. Um, and journalists, especially me, including me, we love change. Um, so for me, it was very exciting just professionally to get to watch this movement take off because instead of, you know, writing a book that um, might have just been less original because of its timing, I was able to really cover some of the first people running for office and the challenges they had and the, um, the platforms they were putting out and to try to use storytelling to really get across what was at stake. You know, I think for me as a journalist, um, I, I think editors, so, so when I am trying to cover a story, my first audience is my editors, right? Like that's who I have to convince. And I'm going to emphasize this because I think sometimes when people are frustrated with reporters or the media, or especially when they're pitching stories to us, they forget this. So editors are very resistant to anything they feel like they've already heard 10 times or 100 times, even if it's like a really unsolved problem, right? Like this is a big problem in journalism. We are not interested in the thing that is still wrong that we have spotlighted before, even if it's not fixed. And that I think that sort of short attention span or like limited appetites for big unsolved social problems is like a big Achilles heel, but we really have that Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes reporters have it and often the editors they're responsible for, they're responding to have it. And so I think that um, that's why change is so useful for us. Um, and in some ways, I think there's just more receptivity right now to these stories of injustice because of, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and protests, because there's this sense of, you know, increasing awareness, I think, in the media of racial injustice and the way in which that plays such a huge role in criminal injustice. And I think the hard part that I see right now, um, and I've been thinking about a lot, is 
you know, it is always our job to ask hard questions, especially of elected officials and people who serve in government. Like that's our watchdog role. Um, but sometimes if you impose a very traditional matrix of, you know, what like a traditional definition of public safety, like that you lock people up, the more you punish people, that's how you make the community safer. Then we can wind up, I think, sometimes asking the wrong questions um, and listening to the wrong players. So I see that especially as a problem in a lot of local news still and a lot of television coverage. And maybe I'm just being a snob here about TV because I'm not a TV reporter. So it's like easy for me to blame. But um, when I grew up in Philadelphia in the 1980s, my mom used to call the local news coverage the knife and gun club because it was the 80s in Philadelphia. Like there was a lot of crime and it was really easy to just come in and like cover the one murder or whatever terrible thing had happened. And I don't think we thought a whole lot about the way that and reinforced all kinds of racist stereotypes and how that gave people a sense of fear beyond perhaps what their real risk level was. And I think this is still a challenge. Um, so here's just a small example I noticed from Philadelphia recently. So I followed the reelection campaign of Larry Krasner, the DA closely, my sister, full disclosure, works for Larry Krasner. So I'm like, want to know whether she's going to still have a job, among other things. And leading up to that election, it seemed like the local press was really buying into this narrative that maybe it was Krasner's progressive policies that were to blame for an increase in homicides and shootings in Philadelphia. And the increase is real. Um, but this question of cause and effect is very uh, you know, unclear. There's lots of dynamics going on. And after the primary, after Krasner won the primary, there was a big headline I noticed in, I think, the Inquirer saying like, hmm, maybe it wasn't the progressive prosecution practices that are really um, causing this spike in homicides and shootings. And I thought like, huh, that's interesting timing that that piece is showing up now. And it didn't matter, Krasner won handily, um, but it's, I, it just is notable that the timing of the media coverage seemed to be not especially um, helpful to the idea of supporting progressive changes like diversion um, until after the election. Absolutely, and I'm glad you actually brought up DA um, Krasner's election because I was going to ask Jess next about it. Um, Jess, obviously you spend an enormous amount of time working with prosecutors' offices, uh, and you spent a, a lot of time in Philly um, in advance of this, uh, this most recent election, which I, I know to at least our community, but I think writ large felt like a referendum, a nationwide referendum, right, on progressive prosecution because um, Krasner had been sort of this poster child in a city like Philly, et cetera. So, um, and 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 uh, he won by a thirty plus percent margin. Is that right? Thirty four percent. Thirty four percent. Thirty four percent. Just just eked it out with a thirty four percent margin victory. Um, <coughs> and so I it'd be I I have a couple questions for you, but I'll ask. Um, when you were, I, I know that local media in particular posed a partic a, a really tough. Um, obstacle for for the DA and really kind of like Emily pointed out really was um, repeating these sort of theories and almost conspiracy theories without really uh, knowing the context or or telling a more accurate story. Um, I'd be interested to hear sort of what your experience was in the election leading up to this and the role that you think media um, helped or hurt uh, his chances. Um, yeah, so I'll start there and then I might ask, I'll ask all of you more questions, but I might have a follow up to that one in particular. Yeah, um, I mean, the Philadelphia media is a lot like Philadelphia. It's like charming and really- Perfect, Jess, is that what you mean to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I think, I think a couple things happened with Philadelphia media during that race. Um, first is there weren't a lot of elections that were happening in Pennsylvania or anywhere else at the time. Like that was the, it's pretty unusual for the DA race to be the big ticket item in an election cycle. And really that was it. So the media needed a horse race. Um, and so that like the way they framed that and the way they framed crime and the way they framed 
um, people's backgrounds and histories as prosecutors and, and the opponent's background as a prosecutor really mattered for that race to seem like it was a viable race. And so I think that actually just skewed a lot of the reporting. Um, and, you know, the article that Emily was just talking about, which said like, oh yeah, maybe it wasn't drug reform and bail reform that led to the increase in crime. You know, I had pitched that story to Sean at the Inquirer for like 10 months. And the weekend before he said, okay, we're going to run it. And who can I actually talk to about, you know, the story? I'm going to give him a bunch of names. And then he said, oh, and then the move, um, they discovered the remains of the move bombing victims that weekend. Mm -hmm. And it bumped that story until after the election cycle. But it was like, we waited until the absolute last minute for them to even be able to acknowledge that. And I think what that showed me was, yeah, like they, this really needed to be a horse race because those reporters at the Enquirer are smart people. They know that there's not necessarily the correlation that they were throwing around between low level reforms and high level homicides, but they kept running with it up until the absolute last minute to make this a race. So I think the reporting was hard, was rough there, but part of the reason it was rough was not because people don't understand crime. It was because elect, they need to sell newspapers. And maybe that's an overly cynical view, but that is my view having been really embedded in that election for a, a very long time. Um, I don't, does that answer your question? That's kind of a short Yeah, one. absolutely. I, um, and I, I, Steve, so I think what, what Jess highlights and um, is particularly true of local media, right, is that they're also kind of facing both a lack of context and information since they're not in the office every day, but also like journalism is, faces its own sort of structural incentives and problems that I think uh, are particularly pronounced on the local level. Um, Steve, can you talk about your experience um, with, like what what coverage has been like since you've been DA since you kind of came in on the heels of someone who um, had sort of a much different theory of prosecution than you do and um, how that has affected your time in office. I'd be I'd be happy to talk uh, to talk about that and I can say that um, Emily I also am a child of Philadelphia of the eighties um, and it is perfect and uh, you know. Local, local six, uh, ABC News was very much the gun and, and knife show every day. Um, and and it, it's, you know, we get a lot of that down in, uh, in Fairfax County as well. Um, you know, the local coverage really, you know, they, they don't have a lot of context. Um, you know, they, they, they really do kind of use that traditional view of, um, of what the criminal justice system is. So it's very, very difficult, um, you know, because what will happen is even we do start to start to see people, uh, reporters, they, they start to get it and, and they are starting to, to get context, but it's so easy um, to run with a very short story, particularly uh, on the TV news, right? You get a lot of, hey, this one thing happened. Um, so, oh, that sounds very interesting or very bad or what have you. Um, so we're going to put that on the news, lacking any context, lacking any recognition that, um, you know, that it may not be an accurate report that they got or that taken out of context. When you put it in the context, it actually makes a lot of sense. So really, um, and, and then the, the, the foundational thing, which is very, very frustrating, is that um, the traditional tough on crime way of, of prosecuting of the, of the legal system. It is widely acknowledged and will be widely acknowledged by individual reporters, newspaper writers, or what have you, that it does not work and has not worked and has failed our communities for decades. But yet that old way of doing things still seems to enjoy this assumption of correctness, this assumption of, well, this is the way it's always been, so this is the way you do public safety, right? And as a reformer, it seems that everything that we do uh, has the opposite, where everything is looked at with a skeptical eye, and we need to to prove every single little thing that we that we do, and and the burden of proof is is so much higher, and not not to complain, right? You 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 meet the world where you find the world where you meet it, not where you wish it was. So what that really means is we've had to spend a lot of time, um, in during my first nineteen months in office, really trying to educate members of the press, trying to really educate the community about what we're doing so that they have a better frame of mind. And also doing things, um, you know, that isn't trying to get them to shift, but to be responsive to um, how they report. One of the great things that we've, that we've 
Um, we work with great institutions like Vera and American University, and we, we, we're we ramping up a three-year-long data project that is going to be just what I hope um, the flagship, the example of what a data program in a prosecutor's office can be in a suburban jurisdiction. And, and we're building that up, of course, um, for transparency for the community um, so they can understand what's going on, but also because we know that when we're dealing with the media, we're going to need those proof points. We're never going to get the benefit of the doubt. Um, so we always want to set things up so where we can arm ourselves so that we're not always playing defense because you never want to play defense. You want to go on offense. And working with the media, continuing to, to be out in the community and have that public support, but also building things in the office that will allow us to, you know, even for the fifth or sixth or seventh time, prove the same point as to why we're doing something um, has been a focus of our office over the first 19 months because, quite frankly, in a jurisdiction like ours, if you're not involved in the criminal justice system personally, uh, which many of our 1.2 million residents are not, the only way that they're going to see it or touch it is from something on the news or something in the Washington Post. And we want we are always very, very cognizant that um, that we need to be getting our message out to those people in the, in the maybe few times that they think about the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, Sam, something that, um, uh, that Steve just said really sticks with me and reminds me of something else I heard you say, which is about how this kind of narrative is affecting opportunities to further decarcerate because it does hold um, so-called progressive prosecutors to this particularly high standard. So in California, there are obviously um, two very high profile recall efforts, uh, one again, not one against uh, George Gascon, the district attorney of Los Angeles County, and then one against uh, Chesa Boudin, the district attorney in um, San Francisco. So what what are you seeing in, in, the, in in California around these efforts and, and um, the drive around them? And where do you think the movement can uh, improve to sort of uh, combat the pro-carceral messages that are really gaining traction in this moment? I think, I mean, from, from where I stand, particularly in San Francisco, we see just an avalanche of messaging um, around the DA that I think many of us know does not actually represent even things in his control or dynamics that are unique to him, but that um, it's, it seems that it is uh, catching hold in some places. Messaging, it, it literally what I said a, a little while ago, uh, for instance, uh, young people, uh, we have a number of young people that work with us that, that have come home from incarceration that were in the Department of Juvenile Justice that have made huge advances, graduate from college, in trade unions, owning their homes, uh, uh, married with children, and they came home in 2021, 20, 2022. We don't hear about them. Uh, and these were, these were young people that didn't go into the adult system. Uh, and so like, for instance, Gascon doesn't want to send uh, juveniles, 16 year olds into the juvenile system, into the adult system. Let's talk about these juveniles that were successful that didn't go into the adult system. But let's also talk about the juveniles that were crushed, that were sent into the adult system. And when we talk about those things, we need to, those people, we need to stop for a minute and ask this question. How many district attorneys, police officers, and judges go into prison and speak to the people that have been sentenced, actually see the human beings? And have they made changes? Have they become better people? Have they realized the wrongs that they've done and worked to improve themselves? Not very many. And, and, and I noticed personally, because one of the things that we've been doing at ARC is uh, cultivating trips like this, where we bring in district attorneys and judges and, and, and police officers. Uh, and, and what we find is they begin to realize that we have to change the system. The system is crushing people uh, when it should be helping people uh, uh, rehabilitate themselves and, 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 and return home. Like the system is not meant to destroy people. That's not the system. The system that we have is supposed to be, what do we call it, corrections? Uh, but it's punitive. And, and if we don't take the time to actually look at the human beings that we're putting inside these, these systems, yes, that have done wrong, like me, then what we miss is the fact that when it comes knocking at your door, when it's your son, your daughter, your grandson, you're going to want a different kind of justice. A different kind of, you're going to want the system to actually help this person heal. 
you don't want the system to help this person write their moral compass and re return home. But when it's not you, when it's not someone that's connected to you, you say, I don't care what the system looks like because you haven't been in proximity to the system. So I, so, so I want to share a couple of things that, that uh, uh, people don't realize about some of the policies that, that uh, District Attorney, Attorney Gascon uh, uh, has been working to change. For instance, stopping district attorneys from going to the Board of Parole hearings in, in, in the state of California. I went to the Board of Parole hearings nine times and had a, a, a district attorney oppose my parole nine times, even though a court overruled them the ninth time. The district attorney did not know anything that I had done while I was incarcerated, how long I had been disciplinary free, the fact that I had cre created programs, the fact that I had graduated from college multiple times uh, with, with honors, the, the fact that I had helped stop different things that happened inside institutions. District attorney didn't know any of those things. When he sat down in the hearing, he literally read from a prescript of what the commitment offense was. Did not take into consideration any changes. Mm -hmm. The same with the police department. They send us the same form letter every single time without saying, has this person changed and can this person now be an asset to our community? And so sending district attorneys to board hearings, and, and I have to point out in California, our board of parole hearings is made up primarily of former law enforcement. So it's not like you can get a free ride home. Right. It's a very difficult task to demonstrate that you're no longer a threat to society. Why would we pay extra money for a district attorney to go in and oppose parole when in fact we have former law enforcement making this determination for us? Right. And so, so that's just one of the, 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 the many policies that uh, District Attorney Gascon has, has uh, 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 sought to change. Uh, gang enhancements. 94% of gang enhancements are, 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 uh, are charged to people uh, of color. Here's the interesting thing. There's a large, what we're finding is there are quite a few people that actually aren't gang members but they get gang enhancements. Why? Because they're, they're, the crime that they've been accused of was committed in a gang neighborhood. Therefore, you have to be a gang member because you live in that neighborhood. Like, those are things that we don't need. Like, what we need to do is stop and look at our system and ask, what is our system meant to do? And then the next step that we need to take is to actually bring people that represent the district attorneys, police officers, judges into our system to sit down and see how our system actually works. Is it working to bring home people that are healed and whole and ready to be part of society? Or is it just crushing people and making them worse than when, than, than when it came in? Thank you. Um, that parole hearing class was just uh, devastating and so upsetting. Um, so Emily, as a journalist, I am also a journalist and we sometimes get bad reps <laughs> um, as a field and um, totally reasonably, I think, um, when we talk about the role that media has played um, traditionally in covering uh, not just sort of progressives in the law enforcement system, but crime in general, right? Sort of systemic um, issues that, that play out individually, uh, we know that there have been a lot of failures of journalism. But I think that there is also a sense um, or a, a missing sense among a lot of people about what the obstacles journalists face. I mean, you just brought up editors, right? Um, but why some of these decisions are made and what, um, what are the ways in which the um, life of a journalist, whether it be a local TV journalist or someone who, you know, works for the New York Times magazine, for example, um, why they might face or why they might be making the decisions to cover things in a particular way. Uh, and what are sort of the obstacles and and um, and constraints that they face? Do you this is kind of a hard question to spring on you. Um, but I'm wondering if there are any of those that you want to talk about that you think can give better context to why we see journalism making some of these mistakes still um, and how to better address it? Well, one thing I think is sometimes a problem is that we as a profession are lazy. And so it's easier to do things the way we've always done it. You know, we're not sometimes that different from the judges, um, et cetera, who are resisting change in that like it takes work to go out and figure out whether it makes sense you know, a new approach, how do you know what the evidence for, is for that if um, people are not following the same script for addressing crime that they've followed before, like, how do you evaluate it? 
So I think that's like a pretty significant issue. Um, another problem I think for beat reporters, and I'm not a beat reporter, um, but if you're a beat reporter, you have to cultivate relationships that you need to go back to again and again. You're a repeat player in a system of other repeat players. And if you piss people off, that's gonna make it harder for you to do your job down the line. And some of the players in the system have a fair amount of power to um, inflict damage on you if they don't like you. So for example, if you are the cops reporter in a city and you rely on the cops to um, give you scoops that other reporters don't have and they get mad at you because you um, wrote a story about how you know, the reason violent crime is rising is not because of like a diversion program for people caught with guns who haven't used those guns, like that's going to be a problem for you. Um, and so sometimes I think as a magazine reporter, my job is significantly easy, easier because I can parachute into a place and spend a lot of time assessing what I think is happening and looking at the evidence. And then I can write one story. And if people get really mad at me, I probably never have to talk to them again which is freeing. Um, and so I think it's important to, to recognize those constraints, um, especially the beat reporter um, constraint because those people in some ways have quite a tough job. Uh, and like, if you don't take it into account, then you're gonna be missing part of the dynamic. Um, right. And then the last thing I want to say is just to support Steve's effort to build some data that shows what he is and even what he isn't accomplishing. Because um, one thing that really struck me when I was working on my book was how accustomed prosecutors were to just like, here's this case and I'm going to adjudicate this case. And no one was really saying like, okay, well, here's a bunch of people charged with breaking and entering and they went to prison and here's another group charged with the same thing and they didn't. And what's the outcome difference? What do we know about the reoffending rates of these two different groups? And what does that suggest about what the best approach is for public safety? The more we have that kind of evidence, the better, I think, decision making, I hope, will be within the system, but also the easier it is to prove to journalists or other people who are looking at your work that, you know, that it makes sense. Or maybe you tried something and it didn't work. And that's also really important for us to know. So I just want to applaud that effort and say that as a journalist, I am so hungry for those kinds of um, pieces of research and databases because I really try to tell stories that reflect some larger phenomenon that's database-based, um, that is not just like some one-off um, tale that I got interested in. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, what you just said about local beat reporters in particular is really hard for people to remember. There's like a theory that all of us journalists are on some listserv together planning our agenda. Um, but it is very difficult if you need the DA or the local police chief or you, you're going to need them for a statement later and you cover multiple things and you're on deadline. And you can see how these decisions are made because of institutional constraints, which doesn't mean that there shouldn't be accountability, but knowing them makes it easier to address, address them. Um, it's also hard if you need the DA to look into prosecutorial misconduct or something like that. I mean, it's very, it really creates a, a difficult um, dynamic there. Um, Jess, I lost my questions. Now I found them. Um, I'm, I, I just have a, a couple more questions and then we're going to do Q&A. So I'm reminding everybody to send in questions. Uh, yeah, we're going to start that in just a quick second. But um, uh, Jess, as someone who, so you did a lot of work in Philly, but you're also working in countless other cities at all times really closely with prosecutors and you're not just seeing sort of the decisions that they're having to make in the office, but the external pressures that they're facing, all the dynamics they're facing with um, other kind of actors in the system, whether it's judges or defense attorneys. Um, and so it's, I think you have a particular lens in that you're in, you're, you're really, you're really in these offices and you're in a lot of different offices at any given time. So I'm wondering if you are, what do you expect to see this sort of consistent decisive support um, for more progressive decisions from prosecutors um, in cities outside of Philly too, even if it's not a 30% margin. And also what are you hoping and expecting to sort of see in this next era of the progressive prosecution movement? When I think back to 2015 um, in Caddo Parish, right? Like James 
Stewart was the like most progressive <laughs> prosecutor we a lot of people had like seen um and now he doesn't he lo it looks very different right than than the ones we're seeing in 2021 and i i were i think shifting into this sort of new era and wondering what you're expecting um okay so there are a couple of questions in there and i'll probably my brain power is very slow right now so yes, feel free to stop me and tell me i forgot to say it's important yeah i have a, i did have a baby three weeks ago um so Yes, I think we are going to still see like a overwhelming progressive support um, with one caveat, which is that I think progressive prosecutors and the left are at a real inflection point right now, where there's so much fear mongering and pushback from police unions, law enforcement unions, um, right wing prosecutors, right, like what we're seeing in California, where Anne Marie Schubert is just going after Tessa Boudin and George Gascon. And, and the Attorney General, Rob Bonta. Um, you're seeing so much of that with the same messaging. And I think we, in terms of progressive prosecutors and the left play into that um, narrative at our peril. So you can play whack-a-mole and say like, no, actually crime isn't that high right now, or no, homicides aren't any higher than they were in the 90s. Um, or they're still at historic lows. I, I think that's really very dangerous to progressive prosecution and to the progressive movement because a, uh, what you know, what Commonwealth Attorney does, uh, Descano does, is so important in terms of people's lives. It has like no effect on crime rates, right? So he can be super carceral and there can be a lot of crime, and he can be super decarceral and there can be a lot of crime, or there can be no crime. And so that's really, really dangerous, I think, for us to do. I think if we continue with these are smart policies, they're rooted in research, they're rooted in humanity and morality, and we're just going to go and we're going to play our game, then you're going to see things keep moving forward in a really positive way because. What people want is an affirmative vision. And when you're playing whack-a-mole and fighting on the like crime and this is a bad story and that's a bad story, we just have no good narrative for people to consume. And I also think that, you know, I'm willing to blame the media for all kinds of things. I love to do it. But, you know, when Emily talks about report, beat reporters need something, we have to give them something. And if we're not giving them like, hey, we're out here talking about behavioral health. Hey, we're out here today talking about police accountability. Hey, we're out here talking about how we need safe injection sites. Then the beat reporters are going to go to the bad stuff because that's what there is there for them to consume. And if we can give them an affirmative vision, I think we're going to still be winning. So that's sort of my long way of saying, I think things are looking really good, but there is a danger of us being put into this, like we're afraid of the crime narrative. And so we're just going to keep fighting that. And then we're not fighting on our terms anymore. Yeah. I, um, I, I really like what you just said, and I would love, I was going to move to Q and A, but I wanted to hear Sam's response to that because I know this was something that, um, we discussed on our earlier call, uh, about affirmative vision and about the vision coming from more progressives um, about in this moment of sort of fear mongering and really trying to create sort of um, a stronger way of talking about this. I, I, it goes back to what I said, like we give the beat reporters stories. We're at food banks giving out after working a 12 hour shift. Uh, we're mentoring and coaching kids uh, in the park. Uh, we're gang intervention is stopping the violence in the community. Do you see this on the news? Have you seen a movie about this? Have you have you seen the seven o'clock news or sixty minutes or CNN or any or anybody like really showing the the impact of this? Uh, no, and, and and part of the reason why like I'm hopeful, but I also understand that the messaging that that's coming from what I what I consider to be uh, well, I won't give them a label, just people that don't believe in hu uh, in human beings. Uh, ultimately, like one of the questions I saw in the chat was about reform and abolition. I'm not an abolitionist. I'm a person that believes we have way too many prisons and too much poverty. And I believe if we attacked poverty the same way uh, we attacked trying to put people in, in jails and cages, we would find that we would decrease the level, the levels of crime even more. And then once we did that, we got to start to figure out what are we going to do with these prisons like Tracy that's closed in California. One of the first major prisons that's closing in 30 years and Susanville that's closing a year after that. How are we doing these things? Because we're, we're, we're one, we're investing in the people, but we don't hear about the investment. 
The, the numbers and the statistics show the further a person goes in their post-secondary education, the least likely they're re reoffend. Do we hear about the college programs and the graduations uh, that, that are inside prisons now and the people that are coming home and utilizing that education to give back to their communities? No, we don't. We don't hear about these things. And so the public is not aware of them. And so the public can't get behind them and support them and tell the people that want to cage people to be quiet. We see the system is beginning to work the, the way it wants and we want Gascon to stay in office. We want to see this happen because what it does is it allows our communities to heal. It tells me if I take a person that would normally I would incarcerate and it would cost $80,000 a year, I don't have to pay the $80,000 a year because that person is now home working and paying into the tax base. Resources, opportunities, we don't see these things. How about the 62 firefighters that have graduated in the past two years that are on the fire line right now that are formerly incarcerated? One of which was burned severely last year during California's work fire season. Did we hear that he was formerly incarcerated? That he, he just about gave his life to save people and property? We haven't heard those things. We don't hear those stories. Why? And so to, to an extent, I think media plays a role in this and they need to step up and, and like and call call out the, the, the reporters and, and, and the media that, that that's not uh, highlighting these stories. These, it, it, it can work two ways. If we think about it historically, real quick, I'll say this. 25 years ago, where were we at on same-sex marriage in the United States? It was a no. Where are we at today? And how did that happen? We started being able to see people in, 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 in different shows like Will and Grace, Ellen DeGeneres. These are normal people. And so 25 years later, where are we at on same-sex marriage? Yes. Like media plays a powerful role in how we perceive people. Last thing I'll say is this, I know I said that once, but if you get a chance, Google this one commercial by Procter & Gamble, it's called Widen the Lens. If you do that right now, widen the lens, you'll see how powerful one commercial can make you see human beings. Thank you. I just, on that point, I think, um, it's there are plenty of people, most people, right, who after being incarcerated go home and just live normal lives. They don't have to do something remarkable. They don't have to, you know, change the world. They go home and they take care of their families and they um, and they get a job and they live normal, happy lives. And you don't see that in part because those stories don't seem newsworthy. But um, I often think about how our expectations for for success post incarceration to make the news. You always have to of us have to be an Olympian or you have to be CEO or something like that when actually there are many success stories of just people living completely normal, regular lives. Um, okay, so we're gonna go to Q&A. We have a lot of questions here. Um, uh, I'll start with this one um, for you about what, I guess this is, this is for Jess, but I think also probably for Emily. Um, Looking at the Enquirer, what can you tell us about the impact of nonprofit journalism on covering stories that relate to progressive prosecution? Um, and can you tell us a little bit more on your perspective of how they've been able to change um, some of this narrative? Or have they been able to change it? Jess, do you want to start? Or you want me to start? Up to you. You're the you're the expert. So you have to start. I don't know on this. I feel like, well, anyway. I mean, I think it's great. I'm all for it. First of all, more outlets is just good, right? Like when we have to compete with each other, that makes us hungrier, that makes us just better. And you who are trying to pitch stories have more options, so bring it on. Um, and I think places like the Marshall Project and the Appeal, which um, is not uh, up and running right now, but hopefully there'll be other um, places as well have made a real difference because they're presenting an alternative to the traditional coverage that used to mostly be in like alternative weekly city papers. Um, and the web was allowed for a real multiplication of that. And that's like all good for the profession. And, you know, I hope good for the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, especially for local news, the Enquirer is a big paper, but like, you know, when you think about the Houston Chronicle, I mean, the Houston Chronicle is a big, Houston's a big city, or like the San Antonio News Express. These are, you know, VC run papers that rely on clicks. So you're gonna see fear mongering stories and stories about Kim Kardashian. 
And like, that's what, that's what's in the paper here. And it gives people such a skewed perspective. So when you have things like ProPublica that can really A, spend the time to dig deep on stories, to talk to people, to present, to look at data, to do a ton of interviews, you get these really, really important, powerful stories then that can really change how criminal justice functions in a state or in a city. I mean, you know, some of the work that we've seen, for example, like Spotlight do in Pennsylvania around the lifer population has been so just critically important um, to for people to understand the flaws in the parole system, the flaws in, in you know, who's governing that. And, and all of a sudden these issues become really ripe in all of the elections and things like that. So supporting places like the Marshall Project, you know, support, go support the appeals attempt to reboot um, you know, the, the work that ProPublica is doing. I mean, we really wouldn't, I don't think we would be where we are in criminal justice reform without those institutions. And of course, like the, you know, the New York Times has people like Emily or, or Shayla or, you know, Farah who do really, really important work, but they're like one in a million in some of these outlets and not everybody has the resources of the time. So you're, you're just not gonna see the same things without nonprofit journalism. Thank you for bringing up ProPublica. It was remiss of me not to include them. So thank you. I had to have something additional to say. It was and shout out, shout out to Big Peel always. Um, and I highly recommend supporting their efforts to restart um, because I do think outlets like that have been really important. Um, related to what you just said, Jess, uh, about data and the ability to kind of um, force some of these bigger outlets to spend time analyzing uh, systemic issues instead of just the individual worst story. But um, Steve, you, you were talking about data collection in your office and that's a huge shout out to Gira who has in so many jurisdictions been crucial about getting some of the data um, in these prosecutors offices that otherwise I mean really just does not you don't see. Um, can you talk about what role the data and technology play in kind of promoting progress you, and, and also what they what they leave out right I mean the data tells us a different story but it doesn't tell us the whole story. Um, and I'd be interested just to hear you talk about what it has been like trying to collect that data um, uh, in your office. Um, yeah, those are all great questions. Um, as far as, well, I'll start with the last question first, what it's been like trying to collect that data and start this. Uh, when I first came in the office, we didn't even have a case management system. We, I literally walked in and it was uh, boxes of paper, floor to ceiling, wall to wall. Um, and quite frankly, you know, I think that's how a lot of prosecutors' offices like it. Um, it's a black box. Nobody knows what's going on. The, 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 the community knows that the prosecutor's office is good. Why? Because the prosecutor will come out and tell you we're the best. Um, but they have, no, they have nothing to back it up, and, and, and the other actors are very happy to go along with that as well. Um, so really starting to collect that data, it required a, the building of infrastructure to do it. And building of infrastructure means getting funds, um, from from the local jurisdiction, we were very fortunate that we were able to spend uh, some of the, the the money that we got from from our county, as well as working with partners to get grants. Um, so you have to build that infrastructure, but you also have to build, quite frankly, the the processes and the willingness of people to engage with that. Um, you know, there are a lot of people in the system who think, well, my job is to go into court, uh, or my job is to make an arrest, or my job is to do this at probation. Um, what am I collecting all this data? And it really does, you know, you have to sell people on why this is important and why it's, it's important to the community and it should be a core function of, uh, of what you do. And so, you know, we've, we've done that in terms of trying to um, sell what we're going to use it for. You know, obviously we're going to be using it for transparency for the community. We always say that we want to bring the values of the community into the courthouse and that we should be judged on how well we do that. And data is a big piece of that. But also, people in this community are and in this office are really jazzed up about the idea that we're going to use the data to root out systemic discrimination, whether it be racial, socioeconomic, even geographic in a county of the size that we have that, that exists, um, and really see if our programs are working, see if our reforms have made the, intent, the intended impact. And quite frankly, where are there things hiding that we haven't seen? This is all in service of that affirmative vision that affirmative vision of building a justice system that is uh, that deals with people fairly and with equity um, and, and really takes a 360 degree view of what's good for the community as a whole. So that is how we got people and we're starting to build it. Now, of course, to build something going from the stone age to the space age takes time. And, you know, we are just at the point now, it took 18 months to, to build the foundation. We're just starting to collect that stuff now. 
But what we've been able to do is because it's been such a big part of the affirmative vision is just the announcement that we're working with this or organization or we're working with this university. We've been able to get that covered in the news because we have really beaten the street over and over and over again and talked to, to reporters over and over again and, and sold them this affirmative vision and data was a huge part of it. So we've been very fortunate in that people in the community and the news um, have seen just the starting of it as a big step forward. And as we build it, we will, we're, we're going to be building a, a Bentley, but as you know, that that's the goal. But when we build a Chevy, we're going to come out with papers in that when we build the next thing. So it's going to be constantly feeding um, with the affirmative vision is um, now, of course, there is, you know, I, I say that data is great. I think most people here would agree that data is great, but data isn't the end all be all, right? We know that there are uh, biases in data. We know that data, you can manipulate it to, to show a lot of different things. So we're not just a, a, an office that's going to rely on the data. We still go through um, the same root cause type analysis when, when we review our system. We still really keep our values front and center in terms of this is what we're trying to accomplish for the community. This is the change that we really need. And then quite frankly, the, the last part that we're really, really, really focused on is um, it's not just me in this office that controls how we're doing that. We've created a Justice Advisory Council of individuals from the community that advise us on a lot of different things, including the type of data and the things that they're worried about. And then we talk to our partners, how can we get at that stuff? Um, as well as what we do is we bring in stakeholders um, that represent a diverse variety of backgrounds so that we're not unintentionally selecting data to pick because they're, we think that, or, it, or implicitly they will um, make us look good or they will uh, prove an assumption that we already had. So we're trying to be very, very cognizant of the pitfalls of data. But in the, in the final analysis, uh, more data is better than, than less. And I think the, the people in the community are really, really excited that we're gonna be taking a data-driven approach to how we um, move forward and how we grade ourselves um, in terms of whether or not we're hitting uh, the promises that we've made to the people of, the, of Fairfax County. Thank you so much for that, Stephen. I want to stay with you just for a second because we um, talked earlier about recall efforts, uh, and um, I understand that there you've also faced a recall effort. You're facing one right now because of um, some of your progressive um, decisions. So, it, could you give some context to that, and also uh, the question requests uh, information about how to support you um, as you kind of face this uh, this effort? Yes, I would love. I would love to talk about the recall. I am maybe one of the. Uh, maybe I'm a, an oddity in that. I love a fight, and I love talking about the fight. Um, so yeah, I'm. I'm being recalled right now, um, and you know, there. The 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 reason I'm being recalled the the. The general reason is, um, I think so, Emily said, uh, journalists like change. Nobody else does. <laughs> you journalists are the one one group of people who like change. Um, so people don't like change, um, and that is kind of the the general uh, feeling behind the recall. But I'll be very very honest, be very very blunt. The the acute reason um, that I'm being recalled is because um, I hold law enforcement accountable. I've indicted local police officers. I've indicted sheriffs, uh, local sheriffs. I've indicted federal agents, even after. Um, the federal government has passed on, uh, on charges. And just recently, I discovered a um, local police officer who made uh, hundreds of unsupported racially motivated stops. And I've gotten individuals who, were, who came to prison because of his cases. I've gotten them released from jail and I'm from prison. And I'm currently working on um, getting the convictions of over 400 other individuals overturned. Um, and quite frankly, people in the system, uh, some police officers, not all, but some really don't like it. And the, the recall is um, a, a, a local effort um, that's localized around a group called Bolster to the Blue, um, who just by that name, I think you can figure out what they're all about in combination with individuals, I believe from the Heritage Foundation who really would like have and have been trying to stop this uh, progress prosecutor movement uh, writ large. We're the largest jurisdiction in Virginia. We're a giant suburban jurisdiction. I talk all the time about how I want Fairfax County to be a model for suburban jurisdictions around the country. 
And I think that they've seen that and they would very much like that not to happen. Um, but the thing that, I, that people have to realize is this is politics, right? You don't come into office day one and politics are over. This is a hard, hard game. This is, uh, this is uh, bare knuckle brawling. And, and, and in some ways you have to never forget that. And, and while I think that the, these recalls are a real uh, usurping of the will of the community, of voters' preferences, um, and how our democratic system is supposed to be, it's something that we have to fight. So we never can forget that this is a political thing that as you, and we shouldn't shy away from it in the progressive prosecutor movement, right? We talk about data, we can talk about all these things, but at the end of the day, a lot of it is having somebody charismatic out there selling it to the people and telling them why this isn't what they should be doing in their community. So that means that when we have to defend ourselves, we gotta use those same tools. So recall is like anything else. You, the, the, you, you support somebody the same way, whether that's uh, monetary support, whether that's uh, if you live in the jurisdiction, having boots on the ground, whether that's being on the internet and you know having support, uh, throwing out data, really trying to, to bust some of these narratives, but whether it's a recall or a regular election, it is a competing set of two ideas that you have to that you have to appeal to people, and it's politics, and we can really, really never forget that. And the last thing I'll say is, um, in my opinion, uh, to to other progressive prosecutors who um, you know might be getting recalled or worried about it. In my opinion, you have to be ready to lose an election. I've made sacred promises to the people of this community. And in my opinion, the way that I go down or the way that this experiment fails is if we get scared and we bust those promises. Mm -hmm. But if we continue to soldier on and really lean into it and say, hey, we always knew that these people weren't going to be on board, but this is the right thing for the community. Let me tell you why. And keep hitting that vision. Hit it, hit it, hit it over again. I think that is the best way for this movement to survive and to thrive. Thank you, thank you. Um, Sam, you were uh, talking about messaging and misconceptions um, among the general public in part because of failures of the media and other, you know, in Hollywood and other places that really do kind of shape our perceptions, um, kind of the, their, their inability to evolve on, on the way that they see some of these issues. But there's this other, um, this is a question from someone else, but this is a, this other uh, issue too, which is these institutional players like police and prosecutors and judges who are kind of deeply ingrained in the system, who do know um, a lot of the injustices that are happening. Um, and I think back to the story you just told about the DA uh, prosecutors showing up to parole hearings with form letters, I mean, who are replicating these injustices repeatedly. Um, and it's great to have George Gascon and Steve and, um, and Chesa really do this incredible work, but they're only, they don't, they're not the whole system, right? There are other, there are other actors in the system, like Steve just said, who are, um, who are kind of tied to the old way of doing things, um, the, the more carceral way of doing things. So how does the work that ARC and other community groups do kind of impact um, and try to try to impact these other players in the system? And how do you think about shaping, um, changing the minds of some of these actors, whether it be the parole board member or the judge or the police officer um, who are actually kind of in the system every day and, and committing some of these uh, these injustices? So uh, how we do it at ARC, uh, we put ourselves in proximity to, to people that don't believe. Uh, it, there's a, I, I think uh, Michelle Hennessy is the head of the DA's union here in California, I think it is. Uh, she, uh, Google it, she wrote a letter about ARC and the work we do. Uh, was not disparaging, it, it was supportive because we do believe in accountability, but demonstrating that redemption is possible for anyone. Uh, she sat with us for three and a half hours and tried to poke holes in our belief system. And it's like, no, when people make bad choices, if they're given the opportunity to redeem themselves and given the resources and tools, most of the time they'll choose that. And so she walked away baffled, I think, even though she it, it did not change her position but she did write that she supports the work that we do, and, and that's what we do. Uh, we bring people uh, in proximity to people that are either currently incarcerated or formerly incarcerated and sit with them and show them that change is possible. It's possible. And, and the other part is uh, when we talk about sentencing, like 
how do we get away from 300 years? Do you want a person to die in prison? But what happens if that person turns their, their life around? Like, should they be given a second chance? Uh, I, uh, we're, we're considered a, a Christian nation and one of the tenets of Christianity is forgiveness. Uh, of course, again, with, with accountability, with a certain amount of, of, uh, of the justice should be tempered with mercy. And when we don't have those things, we end up with a, 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 a system that's the size of ours that's just ridiculous. What do we, I think the numbers are 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the, the, the carceral population. And so uh, specific to your point, we've had conservative uh, legislators side with us based on our policies that we've pushed forward. We've had DAs change their position. We, we've had, uh, uh, we present before the board of parole hearings at least twice a year. We go before wardens. We're now going into now all of the prisons, former lifers to run rehabilitative programs to guide people to understand the steps that they need to take in order to come home. Uh, all formerly incarcerated, full-time staff going into every prison from Pelican Bay uh, uh, to Donovan, from stop, top, top of California to the very uh, uh, southern tip of California. Uh, part of it is they have to see us. They have to see us. If they don't see us, they don't believe that this is true. And when, when, when we're able to be in, in their presence, in proximity to them, there's no way to deny that people can change. And that our system is is is, is not working correctly, uh, or, or is not wor is working the way that it, it was designed to work, but it's not working correctly if we're serious about looking at the human beings that are currently in our carceral system. And so every chance we get, whether it's the LAPD uh, or or the district attorneys, but before Jackie Lacey was voted out, uh, we went and presented before all of the DAs that go before board hearings. And it surprised them the number of former lifers that had returned to the community and were doing great work. They couldn't believe it. They, they, they had so many questions. And the fact is that they never took the time to actually stop and say, do people change? And our, is, is our sentencing structure wrong? Should we stop and think for a minute that maybe we got this wrong and maybe there's a better way to do it? Maybe we need to listen to progressive district attorneys and say, just for a minute, is this something that we got wrong for many, many years, obviously. And maybe we should just take a chance and see if this makes it better for us and in our communities and across the country. Thank you. Um, Jess, one of the major criticisms you see in progressive prosecutors offices, especially I think, I think especially in their initial months of their tenure, um, and Steve, I'd love to know what you think about this too, but it is this push, is this conversation about, sorry, my children just got home. So if you hear screaming, I can't, I can't shut them up. I try all the time. Um, uh, I think one of the major pushbacks you see is about retention, right? That uh, these officers are having trouble keeping prosecutors, um, that there's a lot of pushback from line prosecutors. And it really, I think, um, I, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it, but it does seem like a major obstacle for offices that are trying to change things if the people actually carrying out their wishes are not interested in that. So what are you, how are you seeing that um, across the country in different offices? And what are you seeing as possible solutions or ways to sort of mitigate the impact of um, former staff who may really not agree with a more progressive approach to uh, prosecution? Yeah, this is um, an unpopular view, but this is why I'm never gonna have run for elected office among many other reasons. Um, where the office isn't unionized, if you have a bunch of prosecutors who don't wanna get on board with the reform policies, I think they should all be fired. Um, you know, it's not, there's this theory that it's really hard to find good prosecutors. And so you have to um, have a lot of people who are really experienced. And, you know, like, you're not doing the investigation as the prosecutor, right? You're relying on the police department. There's you get a lot of support as an institutional prosecutor, which um, you know those of us who worked in the defense world for most of our careers did not receive. So you you can train people much faster on that side to try these cases, and you can also find really good people who don't want to sentence everybody to life in prison. Like those people do exist out there. So I would say we should not be trying to hold on to people who have the um, instincts of the past, who believed in these long sentences, who believed in the toughest on crime, like 
there's no right to have that job. And we can find other more exciting people who are sort of on board with this new view of criminal justice to take those jobs. Now in places like where George Gascon works, that's or Wesley Bell and St. Louis County, that's really hard because they're unionized offices. So that's a sort of a different problem. Um, and there are ways to sort of address that, but they're, they are different. Um, you do see these stories, like in Philly, it comes up, like Larry Krasner fired 30 people, right? And how can he possibly have this office? Or um, Kim Ogg in Houston, who is you know not really that progressive and is not my favorite prosecutor in America, but she fired 40 people when she came in and they were some like real killers. I mean, who had Brady violations and were sending tons of people to death row and she got rid of them and she should get rid of them, right? Because those people did not embody the values that she ran on. The media will say this is a catastrophe often because again, they want a story, but the voters said, this is what you should do. That's why they elected Larry. Right? They didn't elect Larry to keep 30 people in the office who were conducting terrible civil asset forfeiture. They elected him to fire those people and start again. And so I think that's really, really important because if you are the elected official and you maintain the same cultural problems in your offices, then nothing is ever gonna change and you don't deserve to be the elected official anymore in that office. Um, I, will, I will say, just because Joyce, you wanted me to, my, to weigh in on yes, this, right? Please, yes. Oh, okay. Um, Jess, I, I share that same opinion. Um, I will say that 19 months in, out of the old crew, I have two uh, left in my office, um, just two. Um, and Out of how many? Uh, I have an 80-person office. Um, so, because I think... He, he didn't fire 78 lawyers, I, I feel like. Yeah, I didn't fire 78 attorneys. I'm not going to say that. That's right, thank you. <laughs> but there were... <laughs> yes, there were, an, uh, there were a number of people who... Look, there was no there was no mystery as to what I was about. During my campaign, I put out a twenty page paper. I said I'm going to do these things, and I and people got the sense of me, and they realized right, what I say I'm going to do. I'm going to do. So there are a number of people who realized they would not be successful in this office, um, so they left. There were some people we didn't keep on because I knew they wouldn't be successful in this office, and some people over time, over the first year, when they saw that I was really serious about these things. Um, we made it. We made a decision to part ways. But what's really interesting is now we have an office of people who are mission based. We built a, a, an office that is values forward, mission driven. We're all rowing in the same direction. And I can't tell you the number of people that are in the office that when I interviewed them, and I would ask them questions, and it would come out, and they would tell me, "I was never interested in working in a prosecutor's office, but I want to come and work for you because I've seen what you've done." Or I don't want to work for another. I want to work for your office. You're, you're the only office I want. I want to work in, um, because there are people out there, good attorneys who care about the community, care about people, um, that just can't ever morally see themselves working in an office that just puts people away forever and is maximally punitive and ruins lives and ruins communities. That, but there are people who buy into the idea that safety and justice go together, and that the role of the prosecutor really is to help the community. And if you do it right, you can help the community. You can build a better place. And it's those people, um, regardless of their level of experience, uh, that we bring into this office. Because you can train somebody to be a prosecutor. You cannot train them to see their role and their relationship to the community in a certain way. And I think when you come in, you got to get rid of people who don't see it and go out and find people who buy into the vision and buy into the to, to, to what you're trying to do and see that relationship and that care for the community they serve. Thank you. Um, so we're almost out of time and I wanted to ask, uh, I would have a question for Emily, but I think I'll ask it to everybody. Uh, so um, Emily recently published an article last um last month that I highly recommend reading in the New York Times Magazine about her efforts uh, along with her sister and some other um, advocates to, to help um, free um, someone serving time who had sent her a letter. It's a remarkable piece, um, but it, it deals a lot with um, eyewitness misidentification and some other kind of, uh, kind of issues with evidence and practices in prosecutor's offices that I think are common, but again, don't get a lot of attention um, from the media or from the general public. Um, and there are so many of these, right? We all know these issues that we wish people knew more about. And so I'm wondering from each of you, from your own perspective, what are the 
what are the specific issues or the specific policies or the specific laws um, um, or the specific movements, I guess, in this space that you are you wish uh, got got more attention. Um, for me, mine is I wish forensic science and and the issues of forensic science got more attention. Um, oh, we lost Sam, I think. Sam, I uh, bet he'll be back. I'm but, sure he has uh, thoughts about this. Yeah, um, but I would love to hear for you all. What do you wish was being covered more? Um, or, or was just more uh, that the general public knew um, when they are sort of assessing um, DAs and prosecutors in their own, in their jurisdiction. Uh, oh, I have to pick someone to start. Okay, Jess, you go. Um, I like, I like to go second. Um, what do I wish first. they knew? I, oh yeah, Emily's gonna go first, then I can go okay. second, perfect. Okay. <laughs> Um, I am going to say anything that's science-based that challenges an existing practice. So, I mean, forensic science is a great example, Josie, like the fact that we still use, you know, these methods of like burn and blood splatter analysis, just all this like crap science that gets into court. I just find it unbelievable that when human freedom and people's lives are at stake, we are so much more sloppy than any academic peer-reviewed journal would be um, about what's allowed into court. And I also think that extends to some of the points Sam was making about lifers. So, you know, one thing about people who've been convicted of a violent crime and given a very long sentence is First of all, they often are not eligible for parole or any kind of resentencing for many years. And so they age out of the period of life we all know is much more dangerous in terms of people committing crime. And I'm talking about being a teenager and being in your early 20s. They um, may or may not have much access to rehabilitation and education. And I totally like 100% share Sam's commitment to increasing that. But they often have had time for reflection and also, like, they got in trouble once for doing one bad thing. And so all of that tends to add up for, to far less reoffending than people who are addicted to drugs. And I don't mean this in, like, a blaming way, but if you're someone who's a drug offender, nonviolent or not, you may have a lot of trouble not reoffending because you're still trying to feed your habit. And so I feel like there's this way in which, like, it's backwards to um, – to start with the nonviolent drug offenders, um, which isn't to say like I'm not in favor of that kind of reform, just that I wish people understood that science because I think it's so crucial to addressing this problem of long sentences with which everyone on this panel has, I think, highlighted and which really is like the big next challenge to get people more broadly to understand. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, when you realize that judges and people in the system actually know just about as much science as the average person, which is not much, it really highlights just how harmful some of the um, some of what is used as evidence is. Just since you want to go second, shall I call on you next? Yeah, I'm ready. Um, so I wish that we saw more attention focused on trauma um, in serious cases when. Um, so my husband and I started practicing at I think the greatest office in America where Angela Davis, who I see um, lurking in the chat also practiced at the public defender in DC. And we only handled really serious cases there. Um, so like someone else handled like the misdemeanors and things like that. And all of the, you know, Chris was trying murder cases and my appeals were all murders and sexual assaults. And all of our clients, were very serious victims at some point. Um, I remember Chris, my husband, asking um, in one of his more serious cases, his client, how many people did you see killed in your life by the time you turned 17? And the numbers are just astronomical. I mean, they are, th that number was like in the 40s of people who were close to him. And when we think about the trauma of black male gunshot wound victims who come through, right, that is a lot of the daily life. We don't do anything to support that community. People become then re retaliatory shooters and the cycle goes on and goes on and goes on and continues. And when we report about a violent crime, it's a mugshot, 
and it is a long sentence and it is fear and it is scary and none of that story is ever told. And so then there's not the urgency for how we support people and what kind of solutions we really need for how we're going to lift up communities and make sure that the people who come into ERs as gunshot wound victims aren't the next shooters to show that people don't end up as the public defender service clients for sexual assaults because their own sexual trauma wasn't treated when they were young. That's just not a thing that gets reported on very often. Maybe it's an isolated story, but it's not like the deep, deep roots of these, this problem is just not reported on anywhere. It becomes very hard for prosecutors to intervene in those cases in any way that has empathy and is actually tied to public safety because there's so much pressure because of the way it's reported on. And so it's hard to do things about violence. And I think we really need to pay attention to who is actually impacted by violence, what their life stories look like, and then what kind of interventions can actually help people deal with that trauma. Because otherwise, we're our system of mass incarceration and our system of really just like torturing people who are in the hardest hit communities is never going to end. Thank you, Jess. We are over time, but I am insistent that we get um, our last two answers on what we think should be covered more and better. So uh, I'll go to you, Steve. I'm glad to see you back, Sam, and then we'll, we'll close on Sam and then we'll be, we'll be done. Great. Uh, I would like, um, I'd really love to live in a world where more coverage got paid to um, what victims of crimes actually need and what they want. Because I, uh, in the pro progressive prosecutor circle, the, the thing that always gets thrown back in our faces is you don't care about victims. And it, it's this view that what every victim wants or needs is long jail sentences. But what victims really need, and there's a lot of literature that's come out recently that has hit this over and over again, is victims don't want to be re-victimized. And they realize that when you send somebody to prison, you send somebody to jail, they tend to come back and they come back into that exact same community. And the question of how do they come back? Do they come back um, with programs, with, with structure, with, with things that will help them um, live the life that we want these individuals um, to live and, and be in our community? Or have they been rehabilitated? When you start to, to really think about it from that and, and get an understanding of what the community and what victims really want, I think you would really start to look at how people are sentenced, how jails are run, how people are treated, um, how, how, how crime is treated, and how individuals are essentially in our system today, they are thrown away and discarded in a warehouse and they're brought back out. And just being put away from the community for years and years and years cannot help but put you back out into the community you came from in a much, much worse state. Um, so I would really like that to be something that individuals covered and really thought of instead of just reflexively thinking, oh, victim must obviously just want jail sentence and that's it. When really, when you take a look at what victims of crime really, really need, um, it becomes very, very clear that large swaths of our criminal justice system are just failing um, these individuals day in and day out. Thank you so much. And Sam, let's close with you. Is there um, a particular uh, issue or policy or, um, or practice that you would really like to see get more attention or be more understood by the public? Uh, I consider, so I, to answer your question is yes. I consider criminal justice reform a change in the system to have four legs to it. Policy, rehabilitative programming inside institutions, re-entry, but the most important piece is something that I learned from firefighters and from my own experience. When we have a major fire in California, what do they do? They cut a break in the fire line so that it can't get fuel. I say that in comparison to our youth that are coming into prisons. The school to prison pipeline has to be stopped. And, and what I mean by that is we need to invest in our young people. We need I, I, go to South LA, go to 115th and, and Figueroa and just walk around and see how messed up it is. And look at the kids that have to wake up every morning to see this. If we need better schools. We need after school programs for those single parent homes. We need dance, art, music sciences, all of these things for our kids in under-resourced communities. Nobody wants to say it, but it's those, those are the community, our black communities, our black and brown communities. If we do that, do right by our children, we can start changing the cycle. But we have to, and, and when I say our children, they don't have to be my kids, they're still all of our children. 
And we need to take that seriously because the, the, the kid that ends up in the Department of Juvenile Justice could easily matriculate into the adult system. But we can also easily stop that person. Think of it. We just, we're coming out of a 30 year war that cost us how much money? How about we take that kind of money and invest it in our kids? Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a great way to end. Um, I am really enjoyed talking to you all. I could talk about a lot of this stuff for a long time. I have 900 more questions about the data, Steve, but I will have to bother you those, you about those <laughs> another time. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. I know you're all so busy and doing such great work, so I really appreciate it, and I really uh, am grateful to Vera for hosting this panel, so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. Thank you. It was a pleasure. A pleasure to meet my fellow panelists, too. You guys are awesome. For sure. Thanks, Sam. Nice to see you guys. Yeah. Bye, Bye everybody. Take care. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank you so much for attending day one of our conference. We do have D2 still coming up tomorrow. Um, I just wanted to close out by thanking our panelists and thanking all of you for attending. Um, there are a lot of moments that I'm taking away with me today, um, things that were said that are going to keep resonating. Um, particularly, um, I have to say, hearing from Fox and Rob about their story, uh, then lending proximity to those of us who may not have direct impacts from the system, lending that proximity. Um, they are real heroes. And uh, hearing Fox say, you know, what we're seeing prosecutors today do is not progressive. It's just fair. Uh, that's a statement that'll stick with me. I also really want to thank Sam Lewis from the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in Los Angeles for sharing his personal story. He's not only doing incredible work as an advocate, as our Fox and Rob and our other panelists, but also by lending his story about standing up in front of a prosecutor nine times who refused to see Sam's dignity and read from a script and was so focused on upholding a punitive sentence um, when we can see how remarkable a person Sam was and continues to be. Uh, these, these stories, I'm so happy that we were able to uplift them and um, I hope our, our, you know, everyone watching here continues to share those stories. Um, if you enjoyed today, please do share the link with others that you think might be interested in joining us tomorrow. To let you know, we'll be starting tomorrow at one o'clock with our third panel, Resistance to Progress, the Role of Race and Gender. We are very excited for this panel where we intend to take a deep dive into some of the genderized, racialized backlash that Black female prosecutors have faced in the reform prosecution movement. And that'll be followed by our workshops. We'll be inviting you to join in one of our workshops focused on legal, media, and community-engaged responses. So with that, thanks again for joining us. You made the right choice by tuning in today, and we hope you'll make another good choice tomorrow. Thanks all. Take care. <laughs>